A cargo ship floats on raging waters. Oblivious to the vastness of the ocean beneath them and the dangers it poses, the group of people on board indulge in dancing and merrymaking. It is a lazy day on the boat, with men resting after dancing till late at night. They soon reach the coast of Paris to restock the ration. The food is prepared, and the captain of the ship, Jacob, is served before anyone else. Later that night, Jacob sends for his chef, Habib. He tells Habib he has a stomachache again. Habib suspects it is in man's illness. Jacob goes to meet his friend, Coder, in a cafe while his ship stays at the port. Coder tells him his business partner is betraying him that very moment in the same restaurant, pointing to a group of men sitting at the table behind him, exchanging envelopes from under the table. He asks Jacob not to look directly at them to avoid drawing any suspicion. He asks him to act as if they are chatting. Jacob shares his wish to get married, as his cook had told him that being married helps with the illness. He adds that he can marry the first woman who comes in the threshold of that restaurant. Though he later says it is a figure of speech, Coder challenges him. An older woman almost walks in but stops before crossing the threshold as someone from behind calls her. The two friends laugh as that would have been a disaster. Coder tells him he is a little short of money, and Jacob being his good friend, lends him some. Coder leaves soon after. Jacob is still sitting when a beautiful woman who just walked in catches his attention. For Jacob, it is love at first sight. He walks up to her and asks her to be his wife. The woman is used to that kind of attention. She smirks and signals him to sit. She keeps an eye on another man while talking to Jacob and asks him to tell her something about himself. While Jacob is being serious, the woman makes it a game where they build a hypothetical story revolving around their wedding. She asks for his name before a man, a potential suitor, comes to their table and addresses the woman as Lizzie. The man is Mr. Ridolph. She introduces Jacob as her fiancé and tells Ridolph that Jacob is a ship captain. Ridolph believes that it is a profession that breaks women's hearts. Jacob makes a wisecrack about Ridolph's inability to ride with them on his ship without getting sick, making Lizzie laugh. Ridolph soon leaves them alone. The next day, Jacob and Lizzie get married. They rent out a place that doesn't have much furniture, and that night, they sleep on the mattress on the floor. Jacob promises to teach Lizzie sailors poker after dinner. They have a mighty meal before Jacob takes out the cards and tells Lizzie about the game they play when women are around. The rules state that whoever loses has to remove an article of clothing. Lizzie is a step ahead and reveals she knows how to play poker, simultaneously wearing her gloves and hat. At the end of the game, Lizzie is unable to control her laughter because Jacob sits there naked. He lost miserably. Lizzie never thought she'd laugh so much at their wedding night. After spending a romantic night, Jacob is ready to leave the next day. He tells Lizzie he'll be back in four months. He feels it would be nice if this works out between them. Lizzie doesn't want him to worry and says she'll wait for him. Days pass, and they travel to different ports, loading and unloading cargo. After four months, Jacob comes back to Paris. Their place looks more like home with the addition of furniture and many other things. They spend quality time together, making up for all the times Jacob was away from her. The next night, they go out to have dinner with Lizzie's friends. After Lizzie's friend takes the initiative to introduce everybody at the table, Lizzie leaves Jacob with her friends. She goes to sit with another friend at a different table, giggling and whispering into her ear, and looking at Jacob frequently. One day, Jacob finds a summon for Lizzie from the police, in the mail. He asks her what it is about, and she says she was robbed a week before while coming back home. Jacob takes it seriously and visits the station on her behalf. An officer is called to translate the situation for him as Jacob only speaks English. Hearing Ridolph's name makes him look quizzically at the officers. The officers take pity on him and give him a drink before explaining the matter to him. Jacob comes back home looking deeply hurt but doesn't reveal anything to Lizzie. Jacob is no more the sea dog as people knew him. So, his life on land begins. Jacob takes Lizzie out to dance. But he can't help the thoughts of his wife's infidelity clouding his mind. Every time they went out, he would get glimpses of her flirting with men. This time it is Dean, a writer. He doesn't let it turn into a brawl even when Lizzie asks Jacob to be nice to Dean, and Jacob is disgusted by the thought of being nice to his wife's admirer. As strong-willed as he was on the sea, he's frail on land in front of his wife. He shares the news about a new job he was offered on the ship Marietta, which is quite luxurious compared to the last. He offers to take her along. On the day of joining, though, he walks alone on board. On a port, Jacob meets his old staff man Tommy, and they catch up over a drink. He tells his old captain about Coder becoming a big shot in Hamburg after he stole a large amount of seized illegal substances. Jacob is happy for his friend. The delicate Marietta sets on a voyage in the sea. One evening Jacob is woken up by a panicking co-captain who informs him Marietta's deck is on fire. He suggests sending a signal, but much to his dismay, Jacob orders to keep moving full steam as he predicts it would rain, which would extinguish the fire on the deck. The sky is almost clear with scattered clouds. The co-captain doesn't have a choice but to obey his orders. Jacob goes to the steam room to inspect the damage, and as he's passing by the guest area, he lands his eyes on gorgeous Gret, who stares back at him from the glass window separating them. For some reason, he can't take his eyes off her until his staff comes with the pupil, and he instructs them not to let anyone out of that room. Doubt has started to creep in as it hasn't started raining. 
He gets anxious and throws up, all witnessed by his co-pilot, who looks at him scornfully. Against all odds, it starts to rain, and the scornful expression of the co-pilot turns into reverence. Jacob's faith and his years of experience in the sea is restored. Once he's back home, he is bemused by Lizzie's nonchalance upon hearing that their ship was on fire. He can't stop noticing Lizzie's demeanor change when she is with Dean. The three are returning from a recital, and it is pouring. While she laughs and flirts with Dean, Jacob is drenched trying to get a taxi. Her expressions change to disgust when he comes back without any success, and she complains that she is not feeling well. Dean pities her and offers to give them a ride back home. Out of courtesy, Jacob invites him for a drink which he gladly accepts, much to Lizzie's chagrin. Jacob has been overlooking Lizzie's shortcomings because he loves her and has loved her from the day he laid eyes on her. But to what extent can a man endure the truth and pretend not to know about her perfidy? So when Lizzie stops his advances because her lover is in the house, he goes to confront Dean. But human beings are always in need of recognition and the slightest hope of being noticed by the men considered to be in a powerful position can change a man's attitude. Something similar happens in this situation. Jacob is ready to confront Dean, but when he hears Dean praise his bravery in the recent fire accident that he heard from Lord Cunningdale, Jacob adopts a more gracious manner. He pours Dean a much-awaited drink. Jacob is further impressed by Dean's suggestion that he work for the rescue services. But when Dean suggests moving to Hamburg, Jacob's bubble bursts, and he remembers what he has forgotten because of the rosy picture that Dean had built. Jacob and Lizzie soon move to their new apartment in Hamburg. They meet Gret on their way. Lizzie chats with Gret, and Jacob stares at the two women chatting like they've known each other for a long time. It is their first day in the new apartment, yet their happiness is short-lived. Lizzie mocks Jacob for being too blind in love that he can't even see she is not jealous of the girl she met that day. The girl seemed to like Jacob. Jacob questions himself, instead of her, about why he puts up with such humiliation. Angry, he leaves for the night. The next day, he talks to Lizzie about their failed relationship and proposes they can get a divorce if she wants. But Lizzie opens a new door for them as a solution, sending Jacob out to have his own pleasure moments with someone else. She even helps him to get ready to go out. And so Jacob does precisely that and starts his extramarital affair with love-stricken Gret. But he's not so good at it, as he forgets about her when he goes to meet Coder, who tells him that the job at the rescue service is filled. Jacob goes to a bar when he remembers he has asked Gret to wait in the park, and she didn't leave even when it was raining heavily. Now that Lizzie knows Jacob is seeing Gret, Jacob has become more desirable to her. She deliberately seduces him to prevent him from seeing the other woman. One such day when he had planned to meet Gret at 10 a.m., Lizzie inveigled him into staying a little longer at home. Gret is more like Jacob, faithful, and holds only one person in her heart. That is the reason Gret distances herself from Jacob even after he proposes to her because she knows Jacob will never be able to detach himself from Lizzie. To take his mind off what happened, Jacob visits his old friend Coder. Coder invites him to a dinner party. He becomes the eye candy for two millionaire heiresses, and he grants their wishes by spending romantic time with them. After the guests are gone, Coder makes him sign papers that would dupe the wealthy guests that had come to the party and make them bankrupt. Jacob returns home in the morning, inebriated. He tells Lizzie about the girls he met, but his mood changes when Lizzie discloses that someone proposed to her the other day. Later he meets with a private detective to collect evidence of Lizzie's infidelity to be the grounds for divorce. Starting the next day, the detective begins tailing her. To make things easier, Jacob calls her from the telephone booth and tells her he'll be gone for two days. Jacob spends his day by the lake where he used to meet Gret. At the end of the day, he decides to go back home. He tries to find evidence to prove his doubts right, but he meets a dead end every time. The detective concludes that his wife is faithful to him as he couldn't find any dirt on her either. Happy and content that he has nothing to worry about, he brings flowers for her that day when he comes back home. Lizzie is happy with the positive change in her husband. Jacob lights a cigarette, but when his lighter doesn't work, he looks for another in his wife's purse. As he's scouring through her things, he finds a matchbox that has a pin and a feather kept inside it. They are obviously someone else's possessions that Lizzie has kept as a means to feel close to the person they belong to. Jacob goes pale as he has finally found something that he was dreading. Jacob is in need of a job, so he approaches the authority of the company that owns Yasmina, a cargo ship. But he doesn't want a job at sea. He's looking for a job on land. They adjust him with the ground employees. Lizzie comes home late. Jacob is still working when she comes. She has a habit of teasing Jacob by telling him about her encounters with young men every time she goes out. This is one of the reasons Jacob is always doubtful of his wife's loyalty because she wouldn't leave him be. Jacob had fallen asleep on his desk. When he woke up, it was already morning. Lizzie is already dressed up to head out for the day and asks for some money from Jacob. Earlier, Jacob would give her money without question, but since he has been out of commission and has just joined a new job, money isn't flowing as it used to. For the first time, Jacob asks what she needs the money for, which irks Lizzie, and she says she is having lunch with a friend. Jacob wants her to have lunch at home since that is paid for. Lizzie doesn't press him much and sits on his desk, trying to get her way by seducing him. Lizzie would do it whenever she needs Jacob to do something. 
but this time Jacob doesn't fall for this banality. She makes him furious when she pushes the ink bottle off the desk and laughs about it because sliding off his work papers didn't do the trick. Jacob takes the vase with the roses he had got her some days back and smashes it on the ground with many other things. Lizzie gaslights him by calling him a clown and smirking at him. Jacob, in rage, reaches out for her neck and holds it tight, but then he loosens the grip as there is someone at the door. Lizzie soon leaves as if nothing happened. Jacob checks his wallet after he comes back from attending to the person at the door, and as expected, Lizzie has taken all his money. After she is gone, he gathers the papers she had thrown off the table and cries, letting out all his frustration of being in a toxic relationship. After submitting the work files, he asks if he could be paid that day instead of payday. But he is refused and is asked to check back in three days. He walks back home and buys some chestnuts from a kind lady who gave them to him for less than 50 cents because he didn't have enough money. He eats them and walks over the bridge, and once he's had them all, he crumbles the paper cover to throw it in the river and soon after, jumps in it. But he is saved, and now he sits in a clinic where the doctor gives him hot tea to drink. And with that, he gives him encouragement to get up and run away as life has given him a reprieve. Jacob is strolling amidst the morning hustle and bustle of the town when he is greeted by Lizzie. She talks to him charmingly as she always does, and they don't discuss what had happened the previous day. She asks him to accompany her to a party, but he has some other plans for them. Lizzie calls her friend to cancel, and they set off on a boat. They spend some time sailing around the city and kiss, probably for the last time. At a dinner conversation, Lizzie says Jacob never courted her. Jacob defends himself by saying he loved her so much he could sacrifice his own life for her. But now it is over, and he doesn't love her anymore. She holds his hand and realizes Jacob is burning up. He is feverish. She takes him home and stays by his side, asking him to get well. She promises to behave herself once he is well. But everything is hazy in Jacob's mind. He wakes and finds Lizzie sitting beside his bed. He had been sick for a few months, and it is already April. He asks her how she managed things without money. Lizzie tells him she sold some of her jewelry. She hands him an envelope. It is oil shares sent by Coder. He wishes they would make them richer someday. Things are better between them, and Jacob has forgiven Lizzie yet again. Jacob has recovered and is ready to take the job back at sea. This time he plans to take Lizzie with him. After finalizing the job, he is traveling back. On the train, he gets an invitation to a masquerade by a group of women dressed flamboyantly. Lizzie is not home when he gets back. After waiting for a long time, he decides to go to the masquerade. There he spots Dean. He follows him for some time but gets distracted by the waiter and loses sight of him. He is looking for Dean when he sees Lizzie. And instantly, the sense of betrayal and doubt overpower him. He quickly leaves the party and goes to eat by himself at a restaurant. But he meets Coder there, who just adds salt to his wounds. Jacob has just reached outside his building when he sees Lizzie getting into a car and the building keeper waving them goodbye. As soon as the car drives off, Jacob catches hold of the building keeper's collar and questions him about where the vehicle is headed to. The building keeper tells them they are going to the station. Jacob runs to catch up to them and boards the train he suspects Lizzie might be in. And he finds her sitting with Dean. Jacob enters the compartment and lands a hard punch on Dean's face. He then turns to Lizzie and asks for his oil shares. Lizzie doesn't want to provoke him any more than he already is and complies. She takes out the shares from her suitcase and hands them back. Jacob asks for one more thing. He gives her a pen and a piece of paper and asks her to write the dictation. He makes her write that she stole the shares with the help of her lover and led a dishonorable life. Lizzie cries in fear as she writes it down. He then makes her sign the note. She apologizes, but Jacob has had enough. He still lets her go off easily, but before leaving, he makes it clear that he will use the note for divorce and will not pay any alimony. She nods, and Jacob leaves. It has been seven years since. Jacob sits in a busy restaurant and enjoys his morning, looking around at happy families. Some women look at him through the window and smile. Jacob wonders if he had a son, what would he say to him as a farewell message? Perhaps he would describe this lovely morning, and that should be enough. As Jacob travels around the city, he thinks about how he would want his son to be a simple man who appreciates things as they come. He's on a tram when he spots Lizzie in a black coat walking in the street. He is amazed to see she hasn't aged one day since he last saw her. To get more intel, he calls Lizzie's friend and asks about her. The friend calls Lizzie the poor dear, and Jacob doesn't understand. He says he saw her on the street, and she looked well. He continues that seeing her was funny because she was wearing a straight coat which is not in fashion these days. The friend is taken aback and asks for particulars of how the coat looked. Jacob tells her the coat was closed on the neck and trimmed with fur. The friend tells him that it must be her because she had sent Lizzie that coat just before Lizzie passed away. Jacob loses his speech for a few seconds and then asks her to repeat what she just said. The friend tells him that it has been six years now since she passed away. She adds that Jacob is lucky that Lizzie visited him today because she loved him so much. Jacob is stunned beyond imagination. He cannot believe the woman he loved more than his life is gone forever. 